news of Jesus according to Mark. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, lording over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Savior. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of Jesus, who came to serve. Amen. I've heard these stories about Jesus' disciples and their expectation of power and position for most of my life. And I've wondered how James and John, or their mother, as Luke tells the story, can be so forward and self-interested when they've spent so much time with Jesus. I'm quite sure I wouldn't be like that. And you probably think the same. We can't know, of course. But we can see in our headlines that people seeking power will do almost anything to get it. And many of them claim to be friends with Jesus. Apparently, the will to power and the perks that go along with it are an unchanging human desire. James and John and all the other disciples have traveled around Palestine with Jesus. And in that time, they have listened to him teach and they've watched as he's healed people. But they have no context to understand him except the context of empire and occupation. They live in a land that they understand to have been given to their ancestor Abraham, but in their day, it's a backwater outpost of the Roman Empire. They can see what happens for people with power. Not only is life more comfortable for them, but their decisions determine how life will be for everyone. And the disciples see Jesus through the lens of this kind of power. They're measuring the distance between their current situation and what they'd like it to be. And let's give them credit, perhaps, for the best possible agenda. Maybe they think that if Jesus is in power, they can help him to move the world in a different direction. What they can't imagine is that Jesus has a vision of a different kind of world altogether, in which the power of empire is dismantled, and human relationships are egalitarian and mutually supportive. In the world that Jesus proclaims, the lost are sought after, the hungry are fed, the broken are healed, and leaders serve the people. The hierarchy of power is dismantled. You can understand why it's a lot for the disciples to take in, and for us to. In the Gospel of John, Jesus shows the disciples what a servant leader does by serving them 
literally at their final meal together. He washes their feet. This was a shocking, radical act. Jesus took on the task of a household slave, and it made Peter, at least, very uncomfortable. And this is the same gospel in which Jesus is most clearly identified by the author as divine. So the author's implication is clear. The Holy One is not an emperor who lords it over subjects, but a servant of all, whose love is poured out in healing, feeding, and the reordering of the world. And Jesus calls us to this kind of greatness. He says, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. We do not live our daily lives in a society ordered by God's dream for us. We live with the constant drumbeat of war and aggression, arguments about alliances and borders and goods, economic challenges, haves and have-nots, the powerful and the powerless. No politician of any stripe can fix and heal the world. But I invite us to listen closely to what all candidates have to say about the vulnerable in particular. Do they have plans to help more people or fewer? Do they talk about power and control or opportunities for all? Do they exclude any of God's beloved people or do they imagine a world of mutual support and thriving? Politicians are human and most are a mixed bag of servanthood and ambition. But we're invited by this gospel to hold those who seek leadership and power to the standard of servanthood. And of course, we're meant to work on meeting that same standard ourselves as we seek power over our own lives. What does servant leadership look like? One of my favorite examples happened during World War II when London was being bombed relentlessly. Even Buckingham Palace was hit. Though the princesses royal were sent out of town, along with thousands of other children, the king and queen stayed in town in solidarity with their subjects. While the princesses were kept safe in Windsor Castle, Elizabeth, at the age of 13, made a radio address to her fellow children exiled from their families, offering comfort and solidarity. The royal family joined the British populace in growing food in their gardens, Later, Elizabeth entered the army as women were being conscripted along with men. She became a mechanic working on transport trucks. Of course, this got a lot of publicity, but she served her full term and actually learned to repair engines. And I remember a smaller, more recent example from the 1970s of a leader who showed us what servanthood looked like. When Jimmy Carter was in the White House, he worked hard to set an example of using less power, specifically fossil fuels, during the gas crisis. He talked to the American public about thermostat settings and speed limits. He wore a sweater in the White House in order to use less fuel for heating. He put solar panels on the White House roof. They were removed by his successor. Comedians made relentless fun of his folksy ways, but he was determined to lead by example when asking Americans to use less. Jesus, though, wants to go a little farther. He wants a different model entirely. His disciples want to ride on his coattails to power when, as they imagine, Jesus replaces Caesar. But Jesus suggests something unheard of. Steve Garnus Holmes, in the poem we just read, offers the image of a circle in which there is no first or last, no powerful or powerless, no top or bottom, but instead a society of mutuality in which both leadership and servanthood are shared. The poet also notes that this kind of society begins with a rejection of the way things are, what he calls the great upheaval. You can understand why this doesn't get a lot of traction with many of us. Change is hard. We experience all change as loss at first, which makes many of us reluctant to change very much of anything, ever. 
much less the way society and money and power and influence work. It's a game that might be unfair, but at least we know the rules. But if we want to be true to the story of Jesus, we have to acknowledge that the reality Jesus describes as the kingdom of God is very different from the way the world usually works. Our poem reminds us of the Magnificat, Mary's song in the Gospel of Luke, in which the powerful are brought down from their thrones and the lowly are lifted up, the hungry are filled while the rich go away empty. The kingdom of God that Jesus describes is a society of care for one another and an economy in which no one has so much that others don't have enough. And of course, this is complicated for us by our founding American narrative. We tend to value the entrepreneur, the pioneer, the pull yourself up by your own bootstrap success stories, and I love these stories too. But with 320 million of us in this country and close to 8 billion of us worldwide, the self-focused model of that narrative is proving to be unsustainable at this scale. Our words and our actions, our spending, our transportation, our whole existence affect others in ways we are still discovering. The planet is in real danger from our choices. For years, we believed that every innovation was progress toward a better world, and we were about half right. But we could not foresee an ocean full of trash or melting ice caps. We couldn't foresee a glut of consumer goods that would fascinate us and fill up our storage units and landfills. Jesus' call to servanthood is hard to hear and hard to undertake in a world filled with interesting things to buy and what feels like increasing isolation from one another. How can we serve others if we never see them? How can we grow and learn if we only consume media that we agree with? And I'm not any different from any of you in this. I live in this world. I take my phone with me everywhere. I order things online. But I believe that I and you are called to measure the distance between life as it is and God's dream for us and do all we can to move in that direction. In trying to figure out what that looks like, I turn again to World War II for stories of ordinary people who found common cause against, at that time, fascism. Dutch citizens hid Jewish families in secret rooms in their homes. French resistance operatives smuggled vital information. People grew victory gardens. In this country, women worked by the score in factories. And there are thousands and thousands of stories of people like you and me working for something beyond themselves. And of course, the nearest example for us is offered by the everyday heroes we encounter all the time. Our school teachers, our first responders, medical personnel, all the helpers that Mr. Rogers told us to look for. People whose job is to serve to bring about a future that's better than the present. And that's what I think we're called to by today's gospel. The call of servanthood isn't theological speculation. It's not about Democrat or Republican or independent. It's about our call to work together for God's future. My part and your part might be small. We may never see what effect our actions will have but we must never lose sight of the larger vision, which is God's dream for the world. Peace, abundance, mutual care and respect, harmony with our fellow creatures in a society where there are no outcasts. This is not hypothetical. Our election is 16 days away. We have critical decisions to make about our state and our country. We don't live in a swing state. But we are voting for people we will send to Washington to represent our state and our congressional districts. And I invite us each and all to think beyond ourselves, beyond the next year or two, 
and think about our neighbors and think about coming generations. We need to measure the distance between what is and what potential exists for movement toward something better for everyone. Our votes are essential in participating in the future of our country and how it connects or does not to God's dream for us. We can disagree about nearly everything and continue to work together if our goal is for everyone to have enough. What we cannot agree to is any political movement whose rhetoric and actions don't reflect the value and dignity of every life. Our baptismal covenant reminds us of those values. We promise to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbors as ourselves. We promise to respect the dignity of every human being and strive for justice and peace. These promises offer a helpful rule of thumb in evaluating the proposed policies of candidates and ballot measures. Print out that baptismal covenant if you need to and take it with you to the voting booth. Steve Garnis Holmes summarizes for us a description of our true call. All of us together, each one first and last, each a part of one whole held in one another's hands, all of us facing each other with all our differences and disagreements, our strange and varied languages and values and traditions, all of us in the circle, belonging, cherished, honored. None are above or beneath, ahead or behind. We are all here, and our hereness, our oneness, our encirclement, the last being first and the first being last, is divine. Let us pray. Holy One, teach us to serve, to help to build a society that is centered in servanthood. Help us to recognize our privilege and to learn about lives different from our own. Guide us toward one another and make us into a circle encompassing all that you love. We pray because of Jesus who came to serve. Amen. Thank you.